Hello, and welcome to the Key Buys event, Digital Edition. I'm happy to announce that we are honored to welcome in our panel discussion, Eric Barmak. Eric is a well-known former Netflix executive, VP International Regionals, who changed history. He basically spearheaded the Netflix drive into regional productions around the globe, and this commanded audiences worldwide. Recently, he launched his own company, Wild Sheep, and he believes that there is real market opportunity to connect Hollywood to the world and the world to the Hollywood. And this is what we are going to talk to him about. I don't know, do, do you know, did you read the email? What are we doing and in frames of which uh, uh, story we are bit, doing yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Just a brief introduction. We're doing like the first uh, market of Russian content, like ever globally. And uh, the participants is more than 120 com companies, which is really much more than we expected. We were waiting around 30 and now it's 120. And it's uh, to be honest, it's both us and Ministry of Culture. They were very surprised because the industry is pretty young. Just to give you some highlights on the industry, basically the government started investing into the industry maybe like 2012. So it's uh, only four or five years when the industry went to the international market. And uh -huh. uh, yeah, so it's really challenging and exciting for us. And knowing that you are a pioneer in many ways, and Russian, now basically Russian content is finding its ways to conquer the global audience and to enter also global platforms and global markets and um, become more global. We wanted to talk to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so sure. we're very excited. And uh, I just wanted maybe to start a bit from your background, uh, from your story in Netflix, and maybe ask you, first of all, uh what is basically most important for you and what was most important and what have you learned from working there well so yeah i mean i i ran the international originals group at netflix for about five years um and basically we were doing all of the television productions outside of the us that were mostly non-english language and i think at the time we thought that it was gonna be important as part of a, a strategy to become a global company to invest in local content around the world, which it was. Um, I think the big surprise was that, um, that that content really ended up traveling as well as US shows did. So like shows like Casa de Papel um, and Sacred Games out of India ended up having audiences that were just as big as the US shows. Um, and so, you know, when I was there, we were recalibrating from like, well, let's do a show or two in each major market to support local content creators to the realization that we were going to have to be much bigger than that um, in order to support what the consumers really wanted, which was stories from around the world. Yeah, and basically that was you who made Netflix uh, change the direction a little bit in a very positive way, <laughs> in a very positive a sense. Bit, so it's a, yeah, it was a group of people, but you know, it was, it was a fun time to be there because it, there was so much that was unknown, and it required a little bit of aggression to change the mindset of like what does international TV look like. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I was proud of the work that we did, but it was you know, by the time I left, there were over a hundred people working on the initiative. And so it was me and a bunch of other really, really talented people um, all focusing on that. Sure, and this initiative was also then basically mul uh, multiplicated by the other platforms. And, uh, but then suddenly you decided to change the side of the table. What made you uh -huh. do so? Well, I mean, there's a personal thing, which is I was, pretty run down and I was traveling a lot. And at the time I had a two year old and a three year old sons and I felt like I wasn't seeing them so much. Um, and so I felt uh, a little um, out of control. Like I just didn't feel like I, I had energy to do all those things. Um, but also, you know, when, by the time I was leaving, I was doing more and more administrative stuff and I missed the idea of going out and finding shows and working with really great creative talent. And, um, and I wanted to get back to that and wanted a new challenge. And I like working on smaller teams with 
a bit more um, independent. So I felt like it was a, you know, I had been at Netflix for almost 10 years at that point, and I felt like it was time to, to take on a new challenge. Uh, and now you're working on exciting projects with Germans, with Spanish also companies. And uh, what yeah. is uh, what is most which you like about that? And what actually, you know, I read the great interview from you from the Variety, where you basically say that your mission is to also bridge countries, talents, companies. And this is very inspiring. Yeah. I mean, it's a great mission. And within the, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that and tell? Uh, how is your work now with this project going on and uh, what are your future plans? Yeah, look, I mean, um, uh, basically I wasn't sure what the business was going to look like and I set up a slate of content that was pretty global in nature. I'd say 80 to 90 percent of what I was doing was going to be outside of the U.S. Um, and a lot of it was going to be driven by IP. Um, because my uh, my basic philosophy is as more um, global streamers get into the game, they're going to be looking for things that are a bit easier to identify um, and, and measure. Um, so like a big novel or a big video game or a remake of a, a doc series might be easier to do um, with some packaging around it than something where you're just starting from scratch. Um, and I also believe fundamentally that the international production companies that are in existence, while very interesting and in, in serving great uh, purpose, are also kind of, for the most part, structured to an old um, distribution model, which is you're gonna have offices all around the world, you're gonna take these formats, you're gonna have a big um, overhead, you're gonna have a sales staff and all of those things. and that that wasn't very um, consistent with what was going to happen, which is that there's going to be global buyers that were going to buy global rights that really wanted great IP and the belief that you could execute against it, but um, with much lower overhead against it. Um, so that was like an important thing. And then, you know, I would say the third part of it was that I was working with so many talented producers when I was at Netflix who wanted to better connect into Hollywood. So um, like, for example, I'm working on a project right now that's for a big streaming platform in France where we um, have access to a Stephen King novel and we paired that Stephen King novel with a big directing talent in France and we're trying to become the first project of Stephen King's that has been done non-English. and. Um, you know, to do that, you need to know the agencies here, you need to know the directing talent there, and you need to know the distribution partner. So it's a lot of connecting dots for talented people so that there's lower friction, you know, and, and I'm working on a project right now with a really, really talented producer in Turkey and a big uh, Turkish film star. Who's look and, and they're looking for a very specific type of script that just doesn't exist in Turkey. So can we find, um, but there's hundreds of spec scripts in Hollywood. So can we think about ways that we can mix and match talent from around the world? Like that as a principle is really interesting to me. Is uh, those two projects, which I just mentioned, uh, you're developing this in this way already, or this is you're mainly talking about the upcoming projects? No, this is these are things that are happening and, you know, who knows what what gets made and what doesn't get made. But, um, you know, we've been able to set things up at at three or four different platforms and one or two different networks and some in the U.S. and some in Germany. And so I think I think there's really a hunger for thinking about new ways to do international content, new ways to do Russian content. Um, so, yeah, I, I want to be a, a small part in the middle of that. Uh, well, since you mentioned the Russian content, that was the question which I wanted to ask later. But basically, you're looking for some pearls and then you put this puzzle together and make this house. Yeah. So uh, what, what, uh, what would you be looking on the Russian market, if anything? And uh, what, would be, what could be interesting for you there? Um, well, look, I mean, Russia has an amazing film tradition, you know, Tarkovsky and all, 
the likes. We could go through all the great Russian filmmakers. And um, I think there's a great tradition of Russian literature, which I'm, you're more than familiar with. Um, uh, and, and a lot of those works deserve, so a lot of the classic Russian work deserve updated treatments getting. Um, so things like Anna Karenina are getting reconstituted into TV series. Um, there's always been a great tradition of Russian films, Solaris on down. Um, I think on the TV side, um, what's a little bit tricky is the Russian TV production community hasn't really been connected to the rest of the European production community in the way, say, that Spain or Denmark or Italy has been. Um, and it's, a, it's more of a feeling than anything else. I think it's also maybe a little bit more challenging for, um, for global distribution platforms to be in Russia. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's happening with those, with those things lately, um, but it's more of a feeling that it's harder to get uh, TV projects up and running in Russia um, despite the fact that there's enormous talent there. Did you uh, watch some Russian projects? Uh, did you have a chance to look at some of them? I did. You know, we, there was one on uh, Netflix that, that was licensed. Uh, that was, what would, I'm blanking on the name of it. That was a pretty interesting project. Um, uh, this is, I think it was Farsa. Is that, is, was that one? Yes. Um, yes, there is this. So, you know, and I had sort of inquired with a friend, uh, uh, like in terms of the development side, like why roadside picnic hadn't been made into, I'm not sure what it's called in Russian, but do you know the, the sci-fi, um, novel, why that, that would be an awesome global show. I just, I don't know how you get hold of those things. Um, uh, and, you know, the vampire movies, the, 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 um, those were also amazing. So I think I, there's, there's definitely like a sense of like, this is a talented pool of directors and writers that should be accessed. Um, um, but, you know, even I, I would say I'm relatively um, connected around the world, um, but have, just have fewer contacts in Russia. I think it's, it's, sometimes it's as simple as that, is how are you getting access to the good ideas? So then, you know, I'm responsible for promoting Russian content abroad. <laughs> and the organization Roskino is actually promoting Russian content abroad. So please help yes. me. How can we help Russian talents to get to the global markets? So what exactly me should be doing in order to make it a successful project? And maybe, yeah, this first part and the second I will ask later. <laughs> I think part of it is just what are you going to anchor off of? So, like, for example, in Spain, um, what are they very, the, the strongest thing in Spain is they have a real finely tuned sense of melodrama. They do everything off of um, sound stages. The writing is very good and they have good soapy actors. And so you know as a core, and so then out of that, you can get shows like, excuse me, like Las Chicas del Cable or Casa de Papel or Elite. And those are various, those are variations on what that country is good at. And when I go to Nordics, like for example, in the Nordics right now, we're developing a female led crime thriller with some really great directors. And, you know, you kind of know what you're getting when you go into Scandinavia. Yes, you will find other stories, but the tradition of Nordic noir is great. Um, and I think with Russia, the question I have for you is, what are you going to anchor off of? And I, if it were me, I think I would be trying to um, access Unearth and develop all the great um, sci-fi writing that's there. I feel like there's worlds upon worlds of great Russian science fiction that could make really interesting live action series, but could also make really interesting animated series. Um, um, I would not try to do those things and make them into English or do this kind of Euro pudding thing where you're trying to combine efforts with 
say, a French or Italian or German company, I feel like those things end up more often than not feeling artificial. Um, but I would ask you, what do you think the core identity that you want to build off of is and, you know, make it easier for producers to get access to the underlying IP? Mm -hmm. Do you know some book or some part, a kind of IP which could be specifically interesting for you on the Russian market? Yeah, I, I'm showing my cards, but yes, if, if we could get Roadside Picnic, um, for sure that would be an interesting series to develop. And it's so unique and fresh and, and really it's just a beautiful, beautiful um, sci-fi story. So that would, be, that would be tops of my list. Uh, then if we talk about global and local uh, projects, yeah. what's, uh, how can you define what makes uh, a, pro um, a product or a project global and why it remains local? And what shall we do here on the market that our products become more global? So what would be your main advice? Um, what's well, tricky, right? Because like when if you define it by language, if you were to say, well, what makes a global show is that it feels more like American TV, so let's do it in English, like a lot of times that falls flat. Whereas, you know, the Spanish shows that I just mentioned are truly global. I mean, you could go back and look at the quarterly reports on Netflix and you're talking about tens of millions of viewers watching these shows. And what's happened is what it used to be to get global is that um, uh, a format would come from some part of Europe, it would get sold into the US, the US studio system would spend years developing it, they would churn it out, and then it would go back out through syndication deals around the world. And um, that's one type of globalization. Um, but I think that's very, very 10 years ago, you know, and um, uh, you know, another another thing would just be the American syndication system in general, like how everyone loves Raymond, shows up in Russia and becomes a big hit show there. Like, that's fine. That's like part of the ongoing ecosystem. But like what's happening now is that there's global shows that are skipping the American markets altogether. So you could have a global audience on a show from Norway that's big in France and Germany, but also Brazil and in um, Mexico. Like I was astounded when we produced Dark, which was a sci-fi series out of Germany, how much traction it got in Brazil. But of course, like if you actually take one step back and think about it, like Brazilians are watching dubbed content. Like it, it's almost irrelevant whether they're watching Germany, German content dubbed into Portuguese or whether they're watching American content from English into Portuguese. It's just whether the show is good. Um, and so, and again, I, with Russia specifically, I kind of go back, I, I need to get better educated on, on what's happening in TV and you have to teach me. But um, I go back to the fact that there's this incredible wealth of really good sci-fi films out of Russia and sci-fi literature and really good VFX animation and VFX studios in Russia. So I think that's the thing. If I had, you know, a hundred million dollars to spend, and I said, like, how am I going to build a global industry out of Russia? That's where I would start. What do you um, think? Uh, and I think I think you know we are making like also I wanted actually to show it uh, to you, but maybe later on I'll send you the link. Um, uh, we are very proud. I'm personally proud of the also special effects com uh, companies that produce special effects and post production, and actually the production uh, here in Russia we have a very uh, uh, high production value but very low cost. So it's yeah. actually um, a potential niche. But also here is a question: Would you be as a producer filming something in Russia, or would you love to do it, or do you think it's relevant in general, or it's not something? which you would consider at all? Well, look, there's, there's two, uh, there's kind of two filters by which these global 
Um, like I, I, as an American, would not have a competitive advantage of going to Russia and selling to local networks, right? And so yeah. if I, yeah, you're like, no, no chance. So if I'm, uh, if I'm trying to, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, if I'm trying to set yeah, no, something I mean, up. No, it makes no sense. It makes no sense for right. you, it's just so small. Well, maybe it is and maybe it doesn't. Like in Germany, for example, I can set up a project with ZDF or, you know, somebody there and then try to sell around the world. But I, I suspect that's harder to do in Russia. So if I were to go to Russia, um, I would be doing it because my belief is that the global platforms are going to need Russian content. Now, like the reason the primary driver for where um, these companies are spending on local content is if they feel like they're going to be able to build, you know, sizable, substantial businesses in those markets. And so, you know, you, they're in these markets. It makes sense that Amazon and Netflix and others are in these, are investing in local content in India, in Germany, in France, in Brazil, because they're big markets where they're going to be growing. And so like the first order um, principal question is, and I'm sorry, this is a very long-winded answer, is that um, the, the platforms would have to believe that they're going to be very, very big services in Russia in order to invest in local Russian content. And so I think the first thing that Roskino needs to do is sort of say like, well, when, when will there be global streaming services in Russia with, you know, several million uh, users each? Because then you're, you're right, like the cost basis of making shows in Russia is, is, is not particularly expensive. The writing is decent. The acting is good. The production values are good. So if, if you believe that Apple and Netflix and Amazon and others are going to have several million subscribers, then that investment in Russian content is going to come. No, I think you, it's, it's then basically, maybe we shall think about that, how we, um, how we estimate it. Yeah. And how we talk to the platforms from that perspective. And if we talk about mm -hmm. international trends. Do you think it's possible to predict the trends uh, in TV series or how do you see it? How you see the development in this area? Where it's going to go because it has changed so much and so quick. I do. Look, I mean, I, I think on a global basis, I think there's too much production going on in the U.S. and I think it's a bubble. So, you know, you have several hundred shows being made in the U.S. and all these new platforms coming out in this competition, and eventually some of those platforms are gonna fold or, or reduce their investment. And I think around the world, you have a realization that um, non-English shows are gonna be bigger and bigger, and there's gonna be more and more competition in the parts of the world that can prove that they can do shows at scale so, you know, if a show in Spain, like, and I think that's going to affect the economics of what gets made where. So, for example, uh, if a show in Scandinavia used to cost a million euros, but it's getting a massive, massive audience, well, those budgets are going to start to climb up towards two million euros. And Spanish shows only a few years ago were six, seven hundred thousand euros, and they're going to be much more than that on a going forward basis. And um, and then conversely, with the what I think is overproduction in the US, eventually um, that pricing is going to come down or there's just going to be less made. Um, and so I think I think um, this is going to take 10 years to play out. It's not like a two year cycle, but um, what's going to happen is all of these platforms like Disney Plus and HBO Max and all the ones you're reading about now, as they get more and more global, they're going to realize that they need to have non-US um, production in order to be competitive. And Amazon and Netflix have already kind of 
um, done that dance. Um, but, um, and so right now there's a lot of markets where there's kind of like a few local networks and then one or two global buyers. But I think, you know, uh, 10 years from now, there's going to be four or five global buyers in each one of the major European markets and along with the local buyers. So it's good. There's going to be more competition for projects, um, in Europe five or six years from now. More competition on local and global markets. I, there was bad connection. Sorry, I missed the last part. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, and some of them will be, okay, we're doing a, a local show. So we're doing a show in Italy that's just for the Italian audience. But some of these markets, and again, I think you know most of them, but like Scandinavia, Turkey, uh, Spain, Korea, like those are all global producers of TV. And so once the platforms match the scale of what the audience wants, um, that those shows should go up in value, I would hope. And how do you see also the development of the platforms, except that they really go local physically also? What do you think else can change? Well, I think there's a little bit of arrogance in Hollywood that um, it's kind of like saying that we're the only place that can do um, uh, great television. And so I think um, that assumption drives um, an expectation that's actually uh, inconsistent with uh, the consumer. So I think Again, if I'm a Brazilian, you know, I'm happy to watch a show from Brazil. I'm happy to watch a show from the U.S. And but I'm also happy to watch shows from Germany and Scandinavia and Turkey and Russia. And I think this assumption that American TV is going to be the the driving force of the industry, just because that's what's been on um, when linear. Uh, networks were basically picking up packages of U.S. content. I, I just think that's over. And so I think it's going to cause a refocusing for media executives about where they should be buying shows and in what languages. Uh, you know, if we talk about like local projects who go global, you really helped the world to discover the Spanish uh, content. And I'm personally very much excited about the developments on the Korean market or how the Korean content grows internationally. So uh, yeah. last year I saw research where basically the, um, the Korean content was on the first place um, in terms of uh, global platforms, were, uh, global buyers were acquiring. So they were selling most. Uh, and this was very interesting in respect of series yeah. that they sold a lot of formats. And now yeah. they got the Oscars, which is also very inspiring. Can you com yeah. comment a little bit on that? How do you think, how did they manage to become that successful? Korea and uh, Scandinavia and Turkey in different ways have things, something in common, which is that um, in some ways they're smaller countries on a relative basis that need to export their content. In Spain is this way as well. Um, in order um, to get to the production levels that they wanted. So in Korea, for example, part of their, their business model was always to be able to sell their shows into Southeast Asia. And for Turkey, um, it was the same thing with selling their shows into the Middle East and Germany, where there's a big Turkish population. And in Scandinavia, you have these countries, you know, with 10 million people that needed to sell their shows into Northern Europe. And um, so the writers were all encouraged to be very, very entertaining and to dive deep into melodrama and to force really, really pulpy shows. And in sometimes when you're in markets like in like Germany, up until recently had not been as successful um, because the German TV market was big enough where they could sustain 
an entire industry without having to sell to the rest of Europe. So in Germany, up until I'd say six or seven years ago, it was these kind of, it was a, these cop shows that were quite predictable and things that would really only appeal to a German audience. Whereas the Scandinavians and the Koreans uh, and the Turks, Turkish people had to um, uh, figure out how to export. Um, uh, so I think that's um, part of it. And then with Korea specifically, like they, they have a really specific um, television production tradition of honoring the writer. And so in the US, we have these writer's rooms with six or seven people, but in Korea, really for each show, there's kind of one writer that has a specific um, vision um, and they, they're sort of responsible for doing 20 episodes and the series don't return on, for the most part. So it's kind of like you do this thing, you have your vision, and you see it all the way through versus uh, having lots of studio notes and trying to water down a vision. So I think that leads to incredibly um, pure entertainment. It's interesting because in this case, we are more close to the German markets because definitely the Russian market is, I mean, it's 145 million people. And it's now yeah. a pretty well developed so both uh, film industry and series industry, uh, and it, actually it was sufficient up to the moment. And now basically all the creators and also sellers and everybody they realize that the global market is not only interesting in respect of uh, profits which you can get there, but it's also pretty exciting to make your story global. Uh, that's why these developments they are now you know like. Um, very active and uh, Russian talents are really interested and excited about, about cooperating uh, with global partners. There is a lot of uh, um, projects uh, for co-production at the moment. So, I mean, a lot. Uh, if I would say that for the first time in years, also the part of the market is the co-production section. And uh, we've uh, we, uh, received around 90 projects which I think is wow. pretty much. And for pitchings, we have selected round 45, which is 16 wow. films, five series, round 12 animation, and also five or six docs. And yeah. for, for us, as for the organizing team, it was also pretty unexpected. So we didn't know that the market is that mature to uh, to deliver the uh, co-production project. Uh, yeah. So, by the way, are you interested in co-production or something like this, or it's more about putting the idea together and having the whole project just with you? No, I'm interested in everything. So yes, I mean, I think co-productions <laughs> are really interesting. Um, you know, I think uh, somebody sent me some stuff on some kids animation from Russia and it's it's really interesting. It's like, what? where would these characters feel specifically Russian and where would like, even in something like animation, where would it be relevant to the rest of the world? Um, but at like, least it has a proof. Uh -huh. tell, tell me more. Do you know the Masha and the Bear? It's the like most, the have you seen the Masha and the Bear? I know Masha and the Bear. My kids watch Masha and the Bear and it's, um, um, yeah. So that, how did that break through versus the 20 other shows that are being pitched right now to, you know, it's, I, it's who knows, but that's super interesting. And I must tell you that um, actually Russian animation, I'm personally being a mom of two, I'm a fan of Russian animation. Uh, it's entertaining, it's educative. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, there is also a big part of education in the Russian animation, uh, which is also nice. Uh, and, and becoming extremely popular also um, in foreign platforms and TV channels. Maybe you heard about uh, mm, Kitty Cats or Kikori Kids uh -huh. or whatever. It's like series which uh -huh. are very famous on the global platforms. And in China, even they think that these brands are local. So this is also interesting yeah. when the brand migrates that far, they, they perceive this or that brand very local, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think it's, you know, it's all uh, shows that in respect of animation, it has definitely a big potential, but now also Russian series, 
they are getting uh, more and more um, coverage, I would say, in the global platforms like Netflix and Amazon. Mm, but I absolutely agree with you that uh, you said you don't know people to connect or you don't know how to get them, or maybe you even didn't think about that. Uh, but honestly, my goal, so I'm really new to the position. And the first thing which I think we need to do is basically to bring this transparency to yeah. basically at least, you know, show who is available, what they are doing, what are the projects. And that's actually why we started this market, you know, because now it shows the whole range of products, projects, and even people. And yeah. uh, yes, so for Could instance, you... if now one of the, sorry, please. Well, um, you know, a lot of the other countries, they'll have these kind of tours of uh, where they'll bring producers out to Hollywood. And uh, have you have you considered doing something like that? Bringing Russian producers to the Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, yes, but I would rather invite you <laughs> to yeah, visit sure. Russia. You know, have you ever been here? You know, I, I was in St. Petersburg when I was a young boy but not, not as an adult, so I'm dying to go. So yes, invite me and I'm Please, I'm come. There. <laughs> okay. No, you know, honestly, because it's very, um, I would say it's um, mindset changing experience also in a way. And uh, yes, I think it could be an interesting also bridge because it's easy to, um, it's it's easy to go and definitely we can bring our producers to hollywood but i think it's also interesting and exciting to bring foreign producers to russia and to connect them also with and show the market and as you mentioned yet yeah, to maybe to talk about the money and like profit potential on the market to show them what is possible and uh, respect of maybe former cs countries as well so as a bigger market Mm. And if we are talking about some uh, project developments, some now Russian producers come to me and say, oh, tell me, please, there is uh, and wild sheep content company. Do you have any idea what do I need to bring him or how do I need to what story shall I pitch him or how do uh, how what is the best way to approach uh, global platforms by you and your company? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I basically read everything that comes my way. I mean, not thoroughly all the time, but um, so I'm pretty open. So I'd say if people have projects to share, I'm happy to, to look at them. I would say, um, you know, the platforms in general are trying to look for things that are uh, where a lot of the, the heavy lifting has been done. So um, uh, so like, for example, in Korea now, um, we're um, acquiring a big uh, webtoon that was also made into a film at some point um, to do as an animated series. And we can say, Here, here's a big piece of IP. It's known. Here's the animation company that we'd be working with. That's known. Here's why it's important for us to combine um, some U.S. writers and Korean writers. And um so I think uh, trying to find things that have um, a big piece of IP associated with it, or in the case of an animated series, like for kids, a lot of the character work's done with it, and you can explain um, quite easily why this would translate to a new audience. That's the first kind of question that we'd ask. And so, for example, before this whole pandemic thing happened uh, in Cannes uh, at MIPCOM last fall, I was meeting up with some Russian producers and who uh, like wanted to do an international crime story that was set between Russia and Germany and uh, the UK. And I, the question I would ask is, yes, this seems extraordinarily hard to do. Like it's a lot of moving pieces, but who's the buyer for it? And why are, why is it gonna be easy to convince them that this is the right thing to do? And um, I often find that the enthusiasm of producers to do something that they're passionate about, syncing it to what the audience wants or what the platform wants is, is the trickiest part of the whole um, conversation.
in one of the interviews you mentioned that producers shall more focus on the data and basical research what did you mean by saying yeah. that so what shall they look at what shall they read or how would you what would you recommend them to do you are talking about the audience um, also so especially with the global yeah, like, audience you know it's pretty challenging yeah look for books they're here it's different in every market but for books here it's like there's uh, good reads, which you can tell how many people have watched, uh, uh, read a particular book. There's Google Trends, which tells you how many people have been surfing for information. If it's, um, let's say, if it's a kid's animation and, uh, you know, some sample has been posted on YouTube, you would say, oh my gosh, this has been viewed a couple million times. Um, I think you're just looking for things that support the notion that something is going to be big and of course a lot of times you're wrong like like casa de papel wasn't big until it was big and then it was you know what i mean and and so a lot of shows come out of um no but in those cases you're betting on really great producers who have a track record so the person who had done casa de papel had also done el barco which was like a big show in spain before that and so you're all you're trying to do i think is look for signals that something has a legitimate chance at cutting through all of the noise out there right sometimes it's the most difficult thing <laughs> it is it is, for sure. it is to find the core so uh you mentioned yeah. the pandemic uh, do you think it will inf influence somehow, or it will definitely influence, but how do you think it will influence everything from production to trends? Um, I mean, long-term, I don't think it will have much of a lasting influence, but over the next uh, 18 months, I, you know, there's such little travel. So I think um, spending, you know, time on development, spending time on known properties um, with known producers uh, is important because a lot of the work that's going to get done between now and the end of the year is going to be writing on projects and developing against projects versus uh, um, direct green lights. Um, I think it has a moderate influence in what gets commissioned. So like if you can come up with a doc series format where you can interview a couple people and do background footage against it, like maybe those projects come to the front of the line because people are going to need content and like super complicated scripted shows in multiple locations just won't get made uh, very easily. Um, but long term, I think, you know, I bet, you know, an 18 months from now, it kind of goes back to normal. If coming back to the, would you come to the market, by the way? Would you love to visit us virtually? <laughs> if I give I would, you the yeah. I mean, access? Yeah? Yeah. I think yeah, because, I mean, because there will be some section of teachings, you know, and I think it might be interesting for you. There will be some series and formats. And it's also very interesting to listen to you, to, to hear your opinion about that, because there you can see the whole range of the content from basically yeah. animation to documentaries. And I think it gives the clue about that, where does the whole market stand? Because it covers all the yeah. segments, docs, formats, animation. And actually it would be very interesting to ask you afterwards, because now I understand you don't have the bigger picture of, the, <laughs> of what the Russian market is about, but also it can yeah. be really, really exciting. Uh, you're also yeah. doing the documentaries, right? Uh, would you be interested in developing some doc films and then what's about they could be uh yeah I mean, we have some projects that we're taking out we have a show that i was working on with uh, vox media called heist which basically is a behind the scenes look at major bank robberies from around the world from the perspective of the robber so it's kind of like a real life casa de papel i have a show in spain that we worked on about it's called The Agent, which is about in one of the important football agents in Europe. And so it's like a look at professional football um, through a different lens, which is the lens of, of how does an agent get players into new, onto new teams. 
Um, and true crime is always something that people are looking for. So there's a project that we're working on in India that's based on a, a series of murders that impacted Bollywood. And um, so I, I think in general, um, uh, yeah, I mean, unscripted is really interesting. I think you have to really come with a strong point of view. There's so much of it. You just have to sort of ask the question, how, how is what you're doing uh, differentiated? Great. So it's interesting. Maybe some of the documentaries could be interesting and exciting for you. So <laughs> we can uh, check it out later. So um, I think that maybe is because we're now it's now the hour since we have been talking and i'm very grateful for your time uh yeah. it was very interesting to to hear your opinion but i'm really curious about that what you say after you visit the market and maybe if you allow me i will just send you the slots uh, and give you some information on what one's going water and what is interesting to have a look at uh yeah and i'm sure that if you're open to the cooperation uh we definitely could find some uh, producers and projects which could be relevant for uh global audiences as well and this is something which could really be very interesting that sounds amazing so i appreciate you having me and let me know if you need anything else and thanks for your time